I try to imagine a fellow smarter than myself, and then I try to think, what would he do? Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. I'm your host, Jesse Lawler, excited to bring you the 99th episode of this podcast dedicated to the ongoing improvement of your own brain by any and all means at your disposal. So yeah, 99, we're on our last double-digit episode. I'm super excited. Next week will be a big one, but this week's actually a big one too. This week we're going to be talking with Brad Burge, who is the communications manager at MAPS. MAPS is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. So this is the long-promised, even longer-requested episode about psychedelics, probably the first of multiple episodes, because we're not really going to be speaking about any particular compound in this episode, but more sort of the state of the psychedelics world, at least within the U.S., how the legal landscape is really changing, how the social landscape is really changing, and what some of the possibilities are for the productive use of these compounds that have so long been demonized and colored by a bunch of propagandistic pseudoscience, but are starting to finally get a fair shake, it seems. So that'll be in the main interview. If you hang around until the very end of the episode, we're going to do a follow-up with the work of Dr. Dr. Walter Longo, who is a Smart Drug Smarts alumnus, you might remember from our episode about fasting, and he's come up with a fasting mimicking diet, along with some other researchers, that's claimed to give a lot of the health benefits of a full-on acaloric fast without being a full-on acaloric fast. So, still not eating as much as you would on an average day of the week, but on the other hand, probably quite a bit less hard to stick to than no food at all. That'll be in the Ruthless Listener Retention gimmick, but let's kick things off with This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts. This Week in Neuroscience. Science. So you can probably hear it in my voice. I am not a pillar of health right now. I'm coming down off a cold and my voice is still a bit messed up because of it. One thing I firmly believe is that being sick is the ultimate anti-neutropic. If there's one thing that will make your brain not work as well, it is having a head full of mucus or running a fever or any of those things. I didn't have a fever this time, but definitely have been a achy sinus mucusy guy the last couple of days. But we're going to tie this into this week in neuroscience because while viciously going through boxes of Kleenex and wondering who I could blame, of course I wound up with no one to blame but myself and the fact that I probably was not sleeping enough for a couple of weeks before getting sick. And statistics show that people who sleep six hours a night or less are more than four times more likely to catch a cold compared to those who sleep seven hours in a night. And while I haven't been less than six hours a night recently, I, I definitely haven't been seven either. I've kind of been in the six and a half hour range. And if anything, having caught this cold is convincing me to redouble my efforts to actually manage my sleep a bit more properly. But to use that as a jumping off point, there is mounting evidence that deep sleep may be an effective break water against the onset of Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's, as we've talked about in previous episodes, is characterized by a buildup of something called beta amyloid proteins or beta amyloid plaque within the brain. This is believed to trigger Alzheimer's disease and attacks the brain's long-term memory. Now, independent studies are starting to show that the people that have the most beta amyloid plaques in their brain are oftentimes also the people who report the most problems getting into deep sleep. And while correlation is not causality, this has caused scientists to take a closer look. And there seems to be reason to believe that during deep sleep is a time when the brain does a bit of cleanup of any beta amyloid proteins that might have built up during the day, says the study's lead author Bryce Mander at UC Berkeley. The data we've collected are very suggestive that there's a causal link. If we intervene to improve sleep, perhaps we can break that causal chain. A 2013 study unrelated at the University of Rochester found that the brain cells of mice shrink during deep sleep to make space for cerebrospinal fluids to wash out toxic metabolites like these beta amyloid proteins. Mander and his colleagues used PET scans, that's positron emission tomography, to measure the accumulation of beta amyloid in the brain, and fMRI to measure activity in the brain during memory tasks, and finally, electroencephalography to measure the brain waves during sleep and statistical models to analyze all this combined data. The research was performed on 26 older adults between 65 and 81 years of age who have not shown signs of dementia, sleep, or psychiatric disorders. So they first received PET scans to learn about their beta amyloids, then they were asked to memorize 120 word pairs, then tested on how well they remembered a portion of them. Then they slept for eight hours, during which EEGs measured their brain waves. And finally, the following morning, they were scanned again with the fMRI as they recalled the remaining word pairs. A couple of interesting things showed up here. The better the memory of the person on the following morning, the less they were depending on their hippocampus and the more that they were using their cortex to retrieve the memories. Cortex is for longer-term memory storage, hippocampus is for shorter-term memory storage. So the deeper sleep had allowed the memories to be transferred to their final resting place. 
And finally, again, the people with the highest levels of beta amyloids were the same group as those who had most problem with word recall. The more beta amyloid you have in certain parts of your brain, the less deep sleep you get and consequently the worse your memory. Additionally, the less deep sleep you have, the less effective you are at clearing out this bad protein, so it's a vicious cycle, explains Walker. But we don't yet know which of these two factors, the bad sleep or the bad protein, initially triggers this cycle. Which one is the finger that flicks the first domino, triggering this cascade? Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast where smart people talk about smart drugs. As usual, I would like to give a big thank you to everybody that's left a positive review for Smart Drug Smarts on iTunes, on Stitcher, on any of the places where one reviews podcasts. We got a review on the Canadian iTunes store from trackmystack.com who said, we've had a lot of people come to our site after learning about different supplements on this podcast. We recommend this show to anyone interested in smart drugs. Really enjoyable show. Thank you. And I got an email from somebody who's used Nexus, our supplement stack from Axon Labs, who says, Loving the product, branding, and the effects. I've hit it today, and amazingly, music that I normally listen to sounds slower than usual. I can only put that down to my mind must be working faster than normal. I don't know how I feel about that. That gives me a little bit of pause. I don't want to be upsetting musicians everywhere by changing the tempo of their music, but I'm glad that Nexus was hitting the spot for this user. As maybe shouldn't be surprising with the way that once you put something out into the world, it starts getting used in ways you never would have intended. I had one guy reach out to me and say, hey, I think that Mitogen is a pretty effective anti-hangover remedy. Were you trying to do that? And I mean, the answer is definitively no. It's like, man, I, I don't even drink. But if it's working for you in that regard, then that's that's just great. Although sulbuthiamine is... A synthetic dimer of vitamin B1. And if I remember correctly, drinking alcohol does deplete a lot of B vitamins, so there might be something to that, but I can't speak to it with authority right now. Nexus and Mitogen, as you know if you've been listening to the show for a while, are the two supplement stacks that we put out in July of this year. They're both available over at axonlabs.io. And if you're looking to augment your medicine cabinet, replace some things that are in there already, or maybe start a medicine cabinet shelf from nothing. In any of those cases, I invite you to go over to axonlabs.io and see what we have on offer there. Also, in the broader world of Smart Drug Smarts, we are getting together a bookshelf page on the website. This should be ready by next week, but we're sort of culling through all of our past episodes, looking at books that have been written by our past guests, or at least referenced in an episode, and throwing those together all on one page, so we've got a recommended reading list for people that really want to dive in deeply on these subjects. Last but not least, I wanted to follow up on the Adderall episode that we had last week. There was one interviewee that we had for that episode who I was not able to actually get into the episode because the quality of the phone connection that we were able to get just wasn't measuring up. It was a really interesting conversation, but it would have sounded more like listening to a World War I radio broadcast with shrapnel exploding in the background. But after corresponding with her on email this past week, she wanted to make sure that I hit one really important point which didn't make it in, which was about a serious mental downturn that she felt after ceasing to use Adderall for a couple of days. She was sometimes doing it where she would take it during the week but then occasionally take a weekend off. She said her Saturdays would be okay, but after two days of not taking Adderall, so on the Sunday when Friday was her last day, she felt extremely sluggish, felt like she was on a major major dopamine low, and even had poor word recall. Was having trouble stringing sentences together. Not the kind of problem you want to be having when you're in your mid-20s. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback on these user perspectives episodes, so if there's a particular compound or intervention or anything like that that you'd like to hear a similar episode around, definitely just reach out. Shoot me an email, jesse at smartdrugsmarts.com. Visit the website, the Contact Us page. We've got the online suggestion box at smartdrugsmarts.com. Let us know, and we will see what we can do. But now, let's get on to the main interview. Smart Drug Smarts. So doing an episode on psychedelics has been a long time coming. We've gotten a lot of requests for it going back months, if not years. But I really wanted to sort of approach the issue carefully when we got around to it. I didn't want to be waving psychedelic colored pom-poms and be veering very far from our core message of things that you can do to enhance the operations of your own brain. But I think it stands to reason that within a lot of cases, psychedelics can certainly fall under that umbrella if used properly. Despite being a class of drugs, and it's not really one biochemical class of drugs, but despite being at least a category that has a huge amount of cultural baggage associated with it. As you know, if you are a human being on planet Earth, psychedelics are illegal, almost without exception in all of the Western world. As quickly as they get synthesized and popularized, they are typically smacked with the ignominy of being Schedule One drugs, illegal to own, illegal to use, and held to have no legitimate medical purpose. Despite the fact in many cases we've known that they have had legitimate medical purposes even before those legal distinctions were slapped on them. But luckily it seems like this tide is starting to turn a little bit, at least within the U.S., and we're going to be talking with 
Brad Burge, who's the communications manager for MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, who's one of the groups at the forefront of trying to turn that social and legal tide. This episode is not going to be about any particular compound. It's not going to be a how-to for psychedelics use. It's going to be more an exploration of the social space, the legal space, and how things seem to be changing and what some of the upsides for society might be if these changes continue. I'd like to kick things off with a quote that I found from Dr. Timothy Leary, who is a popularizer of LSD in the 1960s and was famously booted out of Harvard, where he had previously been a professor of psychology. Speaking about his first magic mushroom experience, he said, I learned more about my brain and its possibilities and more about psychology in the five hours after taking these mushrooms than I had in the preceding 15 years of studying and doing research in psychology. So say what you will about Timothy Leary, the guy was a Harvard professor of psychology, and an endorsement that ringing from somebody with those kinds of credentials, it just seems crazy not to at least have these drugs available for experimentation and research to see if there might be some use that they could be put to. So with no further ado, Brad Burge. MAPS has been around for almost 30 years now. MAPS was founded in 1986. It's been uh, referred to before as the psychedelic research organization with the longest and hardest to pronounce name. Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies kind of has a boring ring to it, which is exactly the point. We're trying to, and have been trying to ever since we were founded, bring psychedelics back into a mainstream conversation and kind of unload bad science and propaganda that's been circulating around them for the last 40 years. So part of our work is reducing that stigma. But the main thrust of our work right now involves developing psychedelics into legal FDA-approved prescription treatments for specific medical and therapeutic conditions. We're working with the FDA, we're working with the DEA and other regulatory agencies around the world to conduct double-blind, placebo-controlled clinical trials to develop psychedelics into FDA-approved prescription treatments. And our main focus right now is using MDMA, uh, the active ingredient in ecstasy or molly, although most ecstasy or molly doesn't contain any MDMA at all. So it's really what those drugs are purported to contain. Using MDMA combined with psychotherapy as a treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. What's the process like to try to get a governmental body to sort of take a second look at something that they've already made a ruling on? If you've been falsely accused of murder, new DNA evidence comes to light and you you are able to get a second hearing. But what's it like when it's a, a chemical rather than a human being that's been accused of something? Yeah, it's interesting. There's kind of two levels to the stigmatization of psychedelics that happened ever since the 1970s. One is the cultural stigma. So just people don't want to talk about it. People don't want to touch it. Uh, Professional researchers for a long time didn't want to get involved with it. Major funding agencies, universities, federal regulators just wouldn't even look at the protocols. They wouldn't look at the studies. They would just kind of fall away into the waste bin for a long time. The other aspect has been the actual scheduling of the drugs themselves. So psychedelics, uh, MDMA, LSD, psilocybin, ibogaine, ayahuasca. In the United States, these substances are all Schedule One, which means they have a high potential for abuse and no accepted medical use. Unfortunately, the scheduling process by which they were added to this Schedule One didn't actually look at the science. It was a criminal justice approach, part of the global war on drugs that sees all of these drugs as things that you can only abuse and that don't actually have any beneficial uses. So the scheduling process ignored the science. MDMA was criminalized on an emergency basis by the DEA in 1985 uh, as the result of the expanding recreational use in clubs. And that made the regulators, the powers that be, very, very afraid. It was uh, psychedelics were associated with a counterculture, with activists, with students, with racial minorities. So locking them up was one way to control them. In the 1960s, when sort of the first round of psychedelics were made illegal, there was a huge counterculture movement, and we were involved in the Vietnam War, and the Nixon administration had the ability to get rid of a lot of political discord that they didn't like by making psychedelics illegal. But in 1985, what was the sense of emergency? Well, just to sort of back up a little bit, MDMA had been already used legally in therapy for many years. uh, A chemist uh, by the name of Sasha Shulgin, who was uh, under contract with the DEA, was exploring MDMA and a variety of other related compounds and introduced a group of his therapist friends to it. And this was in the mid-1970s. So a group of psychotherapists, psychiatrists had already started using MDMA for treating PTSD in couples counseling for anxiety, end-of-life issues, depression, even addiction, alcoholism. And it wasn't until the early 1980s that people outside of that psychotherapeutic community caught on 
And then it started being sold over the counter legally in clubs in Texas and in the UK and started to become a club drug. And that's where MDMA started to become known as ecstasy. So it kind of took off from there and people were buying it in clubs. There was a club known as the Stark Club in Dallas, which was the first place that was legally selling ecstasy. It became a very, very popular club almost overnight. And pretty soon thereafter, because we didn't know too much about what the risks were of MDMA, people going to clubs got very excited. And there were a couple of high profile deaths that got covered in the media. It is possible to very easily overdose on MDMA if you take too much, which is why in our clinical trials, you know, we make sure we have the pure drug, we screen the subjects very carefully so we know they don't have any pre-existing conditions, they're closely monitored, they're not going to overhydrate or underhydrate, which is often the problem in the club environment. So the result of those early 1980s high-profile deaths just set off the war on drugs, which had already been going for a long time. Prisons were already filling up. LSD was already illegal. Marijuana had been illegal already for 50 years in the United States. So MDMA was just the latest one. It's like, oh my gosh, the kids. We have to save the kids. And this was going along with the growth of the D.A.R.E. program, the Reagan war on drugs, the Just Say No. It was all kind of happening at the same time. So the DEA moved to emergency schedule, which means they don't need to go through any fancy hearings and just threw it on a schedule. In fact, a few scientists and therapists who had been using MDMA in their practice testified, except their testimony was completely ignored. And in 1985, MDMA was emergency scheduled. So it was just kind of this reaction to this explosion of public interest, even though previously, when it was just a therapeutic tool, the government didn't really even notice. Not many people even knew what it was. Between 1985 and the mid-1990s, which is when the FDA started to take those research protocols seriously. That just made it difficult to get funding. It made it difficult to find people to support it. But that's all changed a great deal uh, in the last 10, 15 years. I've been with MAPS for about seven years, and just seeing what has happened in that time has just been incredibly exciting. MDMA in the press has gone from something that gets really negative headlines. It's like dangerous club drug being explored for trauma treatment. You know, that's the kind of headline we used to get several years ago. And now it's, it's very different. MDMA being explored for its use in psychotherapy for PTSD. It's a very different kind of message that's going out there. And I think that's happening for a bunch of reasons. One being that we've managed to complete a couple of studies, double-blind placebo-controlled studies, just like any other pharmaceutical company developing a drug. So in 1985, when MDMA was criminalized, Rick Doblin, who's my boss and the founder and executive director, Director of MAPS realized that going the political route, just appealing to uh, remove MDMA from the Schedule 1 of the Controlled Substances Act wasn't going anywhere. It had just been completely blocked. And so instead of going the political route, we decided, oh, hey, let's develop this just like any other pharmaceutical company. Let's start conducting real research. When the therapists were using MDMA in combination with therapy, uh, and this goes for LSD as well and psilocybin, before they were added to the schedules, they were using it actively in therapy and having a lot of success. In fact, thousands of people received LSD in psychotherapy before it was criminalized. But there weren't any double-blind placebo-controlled trials. So comparing it to placebo and being very careful with the research, none of that had happened. So there wasn't any data that therapists could point to saying, well, this is how we should use it, and these are the ways that it shouldn't be used. So now we've got a couple of studies already completed. Uh, one was in Switzerland, one was in South Carolina, with just really amazing results. I'm happy to tell you a little bit about those. And now we have four ongoing studies. They're all fairly small studies, but we're moving towards starting even larger studies with three or 400 subjects. And those should start in early 2017. And those will be the large studies that the FDA will evaluate to determine if they want to make it a prescription treatment. How much have some of these changes been helped with the wars that we've got in Iraq and Afghanistan? And I can only assume that probably you guys are getting a lot of help from the veterans organizations that are looking for really any way to fight against post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, absolutely. You're exactly right. It's an epidemic. And I don't think that's an exaggeration that we're seeing with PTSD. Some of the numbers I've heard, more than 22 veterans a day are committing suicide. That's one an hour. 
which is far more than are being killed in the line of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan. There may be 100,000 veterans right now from Iraq and Afghanistan suffering from PTSD. And for a lot of those people, the treatments don't work. So there's uh, two approved drug-based treatments for PTSD. That's uh, Zoloft and Paxil. And those are both SSRIs or serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And um, for about a third of people, they don't work at all. Also, even if they are working for you, you have to take them every day, often for the rest of your life. So in a sense, they're hooked on these drugs. And then if you're a veteran, I've spoken with some vets who come back and they have to wait a year, two years, three years, up to seven years to even start getting benefits from veterans affairs. And seven years, if you have PTSD, is literally an eternity. People just don't make it that long. So yeah, veterans are coming to us saying, oh my gosh, you know, I'm hooked on prescription opiates that the VA is giving me, or I'm abusing alcohol. I'm trying to find some way to cover up my symptoms so that I can function back here in society. And it's not just the veterans, it's the people treating them. The psychiatrists who are working with the Veterans Administration or therapists who aren't working with the VA, they're really enthusiastic by and large about the possibility that we could very soon have a drug and therapy combination that people only need to use two or three times and then have lasting remission of their PTSD symptoms. That's just something that's so promising and so exciting for them. And the people who are really on the front lines of treating PTSD, I think are by and large excited to see something like this be a possibility. From what I remember, there was something strikingly similar that LSD, early when it was being studied, was found to be really effective for treatment of alcoholism, which is weird that, again, it made it onto the Schedule 1 of having no medical uses whatsoever when, from what I understand, at least anecdotally, there was a heck of a lot of studies showing that it was helpful in that regard. There sure were. Last year, there was a paper published by a couple of Norwegian researchers who did a retrospective look at many of the case accounts, uh, the individual stories of people who had used LSD to treat their alcoholism. And um, looking back at those case reports, again, not clinical studies, just accounts from people who had used LSD to treat their alcoholism and found just overall, yeah, it does seem to help. We do still want to do the research there and see who it's helping, who it's not helping. In fact, the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, Bill Wilson, he attributed his inspiration for the 12-step program in part to his LSD experience. So just that experience of connectedness and, and looking carefully and with compassion at one's own addiction. I think that's something that psychedelics can really help with. If I have PTSD and I take MDMA, or I'm an alcoholic and uh, I take LSD, how am I able to transfer that into something that's useful in the end game of my life once I come down off the drug? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of the pharmaceuticals that have been developed and are continuing to be developed by for-profit pharmaceutical companies, SSRIs, uh, anti-anxiety medications, um, anti-psychotic medications, which are the most profitable product that uh, pharmaceutical companies have right now. What those drugs are doing, just from a, an experiential standpoint, are, are dulling or muting our experience, kind of separating us out from our experience, making it more difficult to engage, which from the perspective of a clinical study or or from the perspective of a psychiatrist might make it look like people are getting better. But they're still having to take these drugs every day, all the time. So there's nothing changing down at a deeper level. With psychedelics and therapy, that's what we're after. We're after a fundamental transformation in how people relate to themselves or to their addictions or to their traumatic memories uh, or to their partners in the case of couples therapy. So it's a deeper transformation that's happening there. And as far as the actual effects go, psychedelics have all been lumped into one category. People will use uh, LSD, heroin, and marijuana in the same sentence. And there's no pharmacological or chemical basis for that. Just high school chemistry will teach you that these things have very little in common. Yeah, it's like saying that garlic, ice cream, and a steak are all foods, but that's about where the commonality ends. Right, <laughs> exactly. But they've all been regulated in this really harsh, controlling, criminal justice kind of way. With LSD, we don't know much about how it works with addiction or alcoholism, but there is something about the profound senses of interconnectedness, uh, the loss of a sense of self, the manifestation of people's darker emotions and darker memories as 
hallucinations in the case of LSD and psilocybin and similar psychedelic compounds that work on the serotonin system. That's probably how it's working with addiction, just kind of rocking people in a sense to the core of their emotions so that they're motivated to change their context, change their relationships, and shift how they're seeking connection. So away from seeking connection from a drug and towards seeking connection in their relationships and in their life and in their work. Again, we need to do more research there to know how the mechanism is working and for whom it works and for which drug addictions and so on. MDMA is a very different compound. We still call it a psychedelic because of how it's used in therapy to bring to light some of these deeper emotions, deeper memories that people have. I'm really glad that you sort of touched on that because I've never done MDMA, but having spoken with a bunch of people that have done it, it doesn't sound like it necessarily is a psychedelic in the sense of visual hallucinations and an extremely altered perception of reality in the same way as mushrooms and LSD and things like that. Yeah, psychedelic, the term, was coined in the 1950s by a researcher named Humphrey Osmond. And the term means mind manifesting. Psyche and delos, psychedelic, mind manifesting. So bringing to light the previously unconscious contents of the mind, whereas the word hallucinogen, which can be appropriately applied to LSD and psilocybin or magic mushrooms, that is accurate in the sense that they produce audio or visual or tactile hallucinations, you know, things that other people around them don't see. MDMA is different. Uh, it does also work on the serotonin system in part by provoking the release of serotonin in the brain that's already there. But it also does some other things. And that's why we're so excited. And that's why the research we think is working so well is because MDMA is also doing a couple of other things. In addition to the serotonin release that's going on, it's also directly reducing activity in the amygdala part of the brain that's responsible for fear and intense emotion, also known as the fight or flight response. We hear about that a lot. When the amygdala is hyperactivated, as in the case of people with severe PTSD, they're constantly on alert. They're constantly afraid. And in combat, say if you're a veteran or if you're in a, an intense or a dangerous situation, that can be very helpful having that, that intense activation of the amygdala because you're always on alert, you're always ready to run, you're always ready to act. But if you're just trying to live your life, and you're trying to hold down a job, and the smallest little memory or uh, thing can make you so scared, it, it's hard to get along. And we've seen this in brain scans of people, uh, of healthy volunteers under uh, MDMA, is that the amygdala is turned down. Not quite turned off, but turned way, way, way down. So that in the context of therapy, that's really valuable since they can talk about these difficult emotions, difficult memories that they've had. If you're a veteran, you know, your combat experience. If you're a sexual assault survivor, then that experience. If you participated in 9-11 or if you were part of a natural disaster, you know, talking about those things can be very difficult. And that's one of the ways that PTSD manifests itself. And that's why psychotherapy can be so difficult for people with PTSD. Because even with a therapist, you just don't want to go there. It's just too difficult to talk about. But with MDMA, that fear sense is dramatically reduced. And so it's easier for people to talk about those things. It allows you to sort of stay in your prefrontal cortex without downshifting to your limbic system and sort of getting scared at an animal level. That's such a good way to put it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's stimulating the release of serotonin in the prefrontal cortex. So you're getting enhanced prefrontal cortex, enhanced ability to remember and recall and to articulate your experience while you have reduced fear. Now, another part of MDMA that uh, I think a lot of people don't know about is that it's also triggering the release of hormones that are naturally occurring in the body. And those hormones are oxytocin, prolactin, and a bunch of others. We're actually exploring that right now in a study at Stanford. We're looking at the blood hormone concentrations of these various hormones with people who are given MDMA as part of a clinical trial. And so these hormones are also known as love hormones or the cuddle hormones. Oxytocin is released heavily in the post-orgasmic state. Women who are nursing have a lot of oxytocin in their bodies. It kind of dilates the pupils, relax the nervous system, and people feel connected or in love or highly trusting of their environment. Of course, at a rave or a concert or a festival or in a place where you're not actually in a safe situation, that feeling of trust and bonding and intimacy can be very dangerous. So the context is extremely important. But in the context of therapy, that feeling of trust and intimacy, it helps people connect better with the therapist. And the therapists that are there in the room, they're seen as more open and, and people trust them with their difficult memories a lot more. 
Is there any truth to any of the demonization tactics that have been used over the years about psychedelics? Are there legitimate causes for concern with these things at a physiological level, assuming that you're not going to think you're Jesus and try to fly off the rooftop of a building? Great question. Yeah. Um, people's choices, that has a lot to do with education. And we've unfortunately not had much good education. In fact, all we've heard is just say no for decades. And so what do you do if you end up saying yes? We know how well that works with teen pregnancy. <laughs> right. Very similar issue, right? It's about choice of what people are doing with their bodies and how do we educate them about, you know, the safest ways to do that. And, you know, as far as the safety goes, you know, again, psychedelics all over the map in terms of their chemical structure and their actual risks in the body. LSD, there's never been a known direct overdose of LSD in the sense that nobody's ever died from taking too much LSD. Now, people have died while on LSD as a result of other causes. You can be given too many tranquilizers at a hospital and that can slow down your heart enough that you stop breathing. But there's no direct toxicity with LSD. You can have a very difficult, intense experience that lasts days, but there's no direct toxicity there. So that fear is totally overblown. The same goes for psilocybin. There doesn't appear to be any direct toxicity. There doesn't seem to be any maximum amount of psilocybin that you can take that will directly kill you. Although we don't know, and so it's better to be safe. With MDMA, that's methylene dioxymethamphetamine. So it does have a component of it that is similar to amphetamine. That one is possible to overdose on. You can take too much MDMA such that it, it stops your heart, such that you're not able to retain enough water. So that can be a real danger. And and for that reason, we do need that education about, you know, dosage levels, about adequate amounts of water to drink, not drinking too much, not drinking too little, having a place to rest, being able to stay cool. So yeah, that's a major concern with MDMA. Uh, you know, also, you know, when people are buying it on the street, they don't know what they're getting. Less than half of the uh, molly, so-called molly or so-called ecstasy that people purchase on the streets actually has any MDMA in it at all. So you're usually getting uh, ketamine or amphetamine or e even they put heroin in them, they put caffeine in them. There's any number of things that drug dealers will put into these capsules just to make people stay up all night and dance all night and then want to come back and get more. Pure MDMA doesn't have those similar kinds of effects. It's a different kind of experience than people are getting with their ecstasy or molly pills. Short of overdosing, let's say you're not dropping over dead from too many mushrooms or too much LSD. Is there other wear and tear that we're aware of that's actually happening at a physiological level there? What we've seen with the subjects that we've treated so far with LSD, there doesn't seem to be any negative long-term effects. We're looking at people who have been through clinical trials and have had adequate support and guidance through the entire process. Also, people who have been adequately screened. So people with family histories of psychosis or active psychosis, we don't let them into the studies because there's a reason to believe that people people with psychosis or psychotic tendencies, those might be exacerbated by the use of psychedelics. So there are people, and we're not sure exactly who those people are yet because we haven't completed the research, although we do have some idea, who shouldn't be using psychedelics. And uh, we've heard uh, MDMA causes holes in the brain. You know, that's an interesting story. Uh, it's an interesting scientific story because um, Oprah Winfrey covered this with a great deal of fanfare, posted up big images of uh, brains with um, big dark areas on them. And they pulled those from a study by a guy named George Riccardi. George Riccardi is a neuroscientist and uh, did a study funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse using MDMA in rats and took a look at the brains of these rats, dissected them after they got lots of MDMA, so typically more MDMA than a person would take, and then looked at the brains. And they had these big areas that were all atrophied with um, disconnected neural connections. And it, it was just a big scare story. And Oprah Winfrey covered it. It got covered in all the major press. MDMA causes holes in the brain. What didn't get covered was that that paper with those quote-unquote holes in the brain was retracted by the same author, George Riccardi, very shortly thereafter because it was discovered that he had accidentally switched the vials in the lab. It was the worst kind of science you can think of. They didn't give them MDMA. They gave them methamphetamine or meth, which does cause holes in the brain, <laughs> but MDMA does not. And unfortunately, a scientific retraction doesn't tend to get the same media coverage that the original paper does. So... Holes in the brain, doesn't happen. We haven't seen it. There's been almost a thousand human beings in clinical trials that we know of that have received pure MDMA. And we have not seen any of that. We don't see any immediate addictive potential of people who take a moderate amount of MDMA a limited number of times. There are no holes in the brain. The dangers have been hugely exaggerated. 
but we have to qualify that with, you know, these are people who have taken it a limited number of times in moderate doses in the context of a clinical study. And those risks might be different when we're talking about using it on people's own on the street. Well, so stepping away from therapeutic uses right now, and also, I guess, stepping away from recreational uses, tell us about kind of this middle ground that is gaining some public attention called microdosing. Yeah, really exciting there. Personally, I think microdosing is one of the more exciting ways forward with psychedelic research. There haven't been any clinical trials yet, but I think the concept of uh, taking a small amount of a drug that kind of barely affects your perception uh, fits very neatly within our existing pharmaceutical model. So there is a lot of promise there. People have talked about using tiny doses of LSD or psilocybin. Those are the two most common ones that people talk about with microdosing for a whole variety of reasons. Cognitive enhancement, helping with work and careers, school, innovation, facilitating innovation. There's been plenty of talk about using higher doses of psychedelics to facilitate innovation. Steve Jobs talked about that. Watson and Crick, the DNA molecule. I thought that was fascinating. I just read about that one recently, but the DNA was first conceptualized on an acid trip. That's very telling. It is really telling. It is one of our most fundamental biological facts. But that they were talking about higher doses. With microdoses, it's much less. So instead of having a, an experience of universal connection and expansion into outer space or hallucinations, people just have a better day. They just have more alertness. I've heard it described as like several cups of coffee without the jitters that kind of thing. So yeah, there's been a lot of talk about that. I've heard Tim Ferriss talking about it on his podcast. There's a researcher named Jim Fadiman in uh, Palo Alto in California who's uh, been collecting case reports from people who have said that they're using microdoses of psychedelics for creativity or cognitive enhancement. Yeah, there's definitely a growing trend there. And you know, just the general cognitive enhancement smart drug movement, it's a growing community, a lot of whom are in the tech industry, engineers, creative people, artists, uh, you know, people who are looking for ways to safely and productively expand their consciousness, but while still maintaining their nine to five jobs. So of course, it's still illegal. You can still get in a lot of trouble for using them, and we don't know what the best ways are. But if people are using them, you know, especially your listeners, I invite them to write to us at askmaps at maps.org and tell us about their experience. And yeah, it's just a way of collecting some of these case reports, just like these Norwegian researchers who looked back at people using LSD for alcoholism. Those case reports, those stories of people who are already using these substances and finding benefit or not finding benefit, or people who are having horrible experiences, those are just as important for this initial phase. Those accounts can be used to design future clinical trials. So it really helps scientists to know what people are doing out there. Play alternate history with me for a moment. I'd love to hear your thoughts on if the Nixon administration had not said these things are all across the board unavailable. How might that have skewed our social growth and what might the world be like now had these things allowed to be used and studied in society? You know, just straight up, we're 40 years behind where we should be in terms of the therapeutic uses of these drugs. You know, 1960s, 1970s, this is when the pharmaceutical industry was really starting to start up. I think not a coincidence that these for-profit pharmaceutical companies with SSRIs, antipsychotics, uh, mood stabilizers, all of these started gaining so much power right around the time that these other drugs were experiencing such a deep uh, and extensive criminalization, marijuana and psychedelics. You know, it's a totally different approach. That is psychedelic therapy uh, is a totally different approach than our current approach to treating mental illness. We've gotten used to developing drugs uh, according to this lock and key kind of schema, where if there's something not working in somebody's life, if they're having a, a life issue or a relationship issue or a mood issue, it's because there's one little piece of their brain that's broken. That's how our system has developed. That's how, by and large, the FDA drug development system works, is by looking, okay, look, we've got this one problem in a brain. There must be some drug out there that we can just plug in. It'll fix it. And that's highly simplified, totally nonsensical, if you think about it for a second, approach to neuroscience. It's just not how our brains work. It's not how human experience works. It's much more complex than that. So I think we would have, if we hadn't seen that criminalization and if research had been allowed to continue, psychedelic therapy might be fully integrated into our culture at this point. People would not be locked up and thrown in jail 
for using them. We would know a lot more about their safety and how not to use them also, also their risks. And, um, you know, maybe we never would have had developed antipsychotics. Maybe we wouldn't be giving two-year-olds psychiatric medications. Maybe we'd have a whole different concept about how healing works rather than just addressing symptoms and trying to make people feel better in the here and now in a 10-minute psychiatrist appointment, maybe we would actually be treating people's deeper issues and allowing people to have just a few sessions and then move on with their lives. What are the costs of these studies? If somebody hears this podcast and they want to donate to the cause, I mean, how much money do you need to move forward with some of these pieces of research? Well, for a usual pharmaceutical development trial, Pfizer, Novartis, these groups can pay up to a billion dollars or more to develop a drug that's not significantly different from the existing drugs out there. For us, what we need at this point to develop MDMA-assisted psychotherapy into an FDA-approved prescription treatment for PTSD is around $21 million. And we have about a half of that already pledged or donated. So it's really only 10 or $13 million, and which is a drop in the bucket for a lot of folks who want to see transformations in mental health care and who want to see these drugs made more available and want to see the stigma decrease. Smart Drug Smarts. So a big thank you to Brad Burge for taking the time for that interview. It has been an interesting process and a bit of an uphill battle trying to get academic research types to come on and talk about the psychedelic compounds, any of them really, because of a lot of the issues that we just talked about in this past interview. Although the doors to research are finally starting to open, the scientists who are starting to do that research are very cognizant of the fact that the doors could swing back the other way too and they really don't want to be seen as being overly enthusiastic about the use of these drugs or popularizing them or doing anything that could make the government say, well, never mind. All that research that you were going to do, we're yanking that funding and let's go back to 1985. Luckily for us, MAPS is a horse of a different color. They are not an academic institution. They do not need to pretend to be neutral. They are overtly on the pro-psychedelic side of the fence, and for a lot of good reason, I think. And I really thank Brad Burge for taking the time to explain some of that reasoning. I do intend to do some more episodes that are on specific psychedelic compounds. I'd really like to do a psilocybin episode in the future. I would really like to do an LSD episode in the future, and possibly others as well. Needless to say, approaching the topics with the dignity and gravitas necessary for important subjects, and not like to scare off deservedly cautious academic types. But that's in the future. For right now, let's move on to the ruthless listener retention gimmick. Smart drug smarts. Ruthless listener retention gimmick. So probably one of the most overused terms in the world of productivity hacking and self-improvement and things like that is the 80-20. What's the 80-20 of something? Where can I apply 20% of the effort and get 80% of the results? I, I believe this is also called the Pareto principle or the Pareto principle, but I'm not going to look that up right now. I, I forget exactly what the uh, guy's name that this derives from is. Anyway, a past interview expert on Smart Drug Smarts, Dr. Walter Longo, who we spoke with about fasting after I did the week-long fast in February of this year, may have cracked the nut to get the 80-20 of acaloric fasting. Where can you do something that is not as difficult as an acaloric fast, but still pick up most of the benefits, which in the case of fasting is slowing down aging, boosting the immune system, cutting the risk of heart disease and cancer, and a host of other things that we would pretty much all agree are desirable physical results. Nevertheless, not eating is not something that is attractive to most people. For some of us, it is worth the effort and the application of willpower. For other people, they just assume not do it. But it might have gotten easier with the fasting mimicking diet from, as mentioned, Professor Walter Longo at the USC Davis School of Gerontology and director of the USC Longevity Institute. The fasting mimicking diet is a five-day diet that only needs to be followed five days a month. And then for the remainder of the month, people go back to eating whatever they normally would, good or bad. Day one of the diet has people eating only 1,090 calories, of which the macronutrient ratio is kept to 10% protein, 56% fat, and 34% carbs. And then days two to five are down to 725 calories, which is not a lot, but it's a lot more than zero. Here you aim for 9% protein, 44% fat, and 47% carbs. Feeding mice an equivalent restricted diet elevated the number of regenerative stem cells in their organs, including the brain, where it encouraged the creation of new neurons, which resulted in the mice having improved memory and learning. When fed to middle-aged mice, the diet reduced the incidence of cancer, boosted the immune system, reduced inflammatory diseases, and on and on and on. 
It's about reprogramming the body so it enters a slower aging mode, but also rejuvenating it through stem cell-based regeneration, says Professor Longo. Longo believes that for most normal people, the fasting-mimicking diet could be done once every three to six months, depending on the abdominal circumference and the person's health status. For obese subjects or those with elevated disease factors, it could be done as frequently as once every two weeks. This is pretty interesting to me, especially because February, when I was planning on doing another full week of not eating anything, is not that far off anymore, and if it seems like similarly effective results might be possible with something that's going to sap a lot less willpower that i'm curious about so i might try to get dr longo on for another episode and dive deeper into this diet and the studies behind it because as awesome as extended lifespan and all the rest is fasting is no walk in the park just say no to drug ah scratch that say yes to the smart drug smarts podcast Join our mailing list at www.smartdrugsmarts.com. Okay, so that is the very, very end of episode 99, our last double-digit episode of Smart Drug Smarts. If you're still here and you want to get your friends psyched up about next week's episode, you can tell them that we're going to have something pretty special for episode 100. There's been a lot of speculation. Speculation has been rife. We've heard rumors of talking dogs who got smarter from nootropics. We've heard rumors of time travelers from the future telling us how people in 35 years are going to be competing with artificial intelligence trying to maintain intellectual supremacy and even weirder speculations than that, none of which are accurate. But what we actually do have planned is still going to be really, really cool. So I will do my best to bring my normal singing voice and not have this lingering cold. And you, you just bring your earbuds and join me back here. The show notes for this week will be online at smartdrugsmarts.com slash episode 99, including the links to everything that we talked about here. And we will be back at you next week, next Friday, same time, same podcast, and with the same unflagging commitment to helping you fine-tune the performance of your own brain. Have a great week and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smarts should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.